So, hey, uh, I want to say in this space, so this is Easter Sunday, right? Easter Sunday, and it marks the single most important day of the year for Christ's followers. Uh, every other uh, religion fails under this one notion that Christianity is the only one, and what the biblical writers chronicle for us about this day separates our faith from everything else because we worship a risen Savior. Amen? Amen. We do. And with that, the Christian faith, of course, um, centers around the life of Jesus, but Jesus' life centers around an event. An event. The event is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He has come out of the grave. He is alive. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Praise God. And so um, for me, this is such a special moment because it marks the 25th year in a row that I get to choose a passage of Scripture for us to focus on, for us to think about, to help us identify and connect with and better understand this story of all stories, the story of the resurrection. And today what I want to do is I want to read to you a, an account, a biblical account, a resurrection account from Luke's gospel. And I, what I want to read to you uh, is not really an account of what happened at the grave, but what Luke chronicles for us is that it's a resurrection encounter that happened later the very same day. And so I want to read to you this story. It's often called the story of the two on the Emmaus Road. And it happens in Luke chapter 24. I want to read it to you in its entirety. Here is what it says. Luke says, now the very same day, this is the same day as the resurrection. So now the very same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were walking with, uh, and talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, and, but they were kept from recognizing him. And so he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And they stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them na named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one, like, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, Jesus asked. Well, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, for, you know, he was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people and the chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped and there's an important word there. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is now the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. And they went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find the, his body. And they came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. And then he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory and beginning with Moses then and the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself. And as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening, and the day is now almost over. And so he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. And they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. And there they found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. And then the two told what had happened on the way 
and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Let's pray together. God, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that on this day, which, Lord, for those of us as Christ followers, as those of us wanting to learn, as those of us wanting to deepen our faith, Lord, we know that this is not just any day. But, Lord God, all of our faith rests on the foundation established in what this day reports to us. Just like the angels of old when they said, and why do you search for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And so God, I pray today that you will use my words in this space to speak your words and your truth of life and hope to your people. For we pray together in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. So here's what I want you to know and what I want you to think about. This is, this is Luke's gospel. This is Luke's perspective on the life of Jesus. And uh, when I think about this, um, we all know that we have four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And sometimes when I'm in conversations with people, sometimes with y'all, you'll ask me, you know, uh, what is the one thing I can do that can deepen uh, my faith and move the needle toward greater understanding of who this Jesus is. And I'll often tell people my answer is this, read the Gospels. Just read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Start at Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, and then when you get through to John chapter 21, go back to Matthew 1 and start over. Just read the Gospels, because they each give a unique perspective, their own unique perspective on the life of Jesus Christ. And uh, sometimes people ask me to explain, you know, like, why should I read the Gospels, and why is it important that I understand each one as a perspective? And I, this is what I often tell people. It's sort of, I say this. So imagine you were at an event, and, and you saw, you witnessed this great thing. Maybe you're at, like, a, a baseball game, and you witness this incredible catch. Maybe, like, this catch. For those of us in the baseball world, we know that this is Willie Mays. This is September 20. Uh, 9th, 1954, this is game one of the World Series between the Giants and, and Cleveland Indians. And a guy by the name of Vic Wirtz fires this deep shot into center field, and Willie Mays is going to go catch the ball. And almost every single person in that stadium thought there was no way when the ball cracked off Wirtz's bat that he was ever, Willie Mays was ever going to be able to catch the ball. And he did this amazing thing. When he realized the ball was coming to him, Mays did what only Mays had done, would do in that era, and he turned and he ran away from the ball. He didn't even face it. He ran back. And there's this incredible moment. You can see the picture there where uh, the ball just gently flies over, you know, Willie Mays' left shoulder, and he catches the ball. And there were probably, if you think about it, only two people in that stadium that day that knew for sure he was going to catch the ball, Willie Mays and a reporter who had been studying the life of Willie Mays as an athlete on the field. And he had been spending the last year or so uh, sitting in different vantage points in the stadium watching Willie Mays do what Willie Mays did. And he picked up about halfway through the season something that most of us would miss, and that's this. Whenever Willie Mays was convinced he would catch the ball, he would hit his hand into his glove as a signal to himself that he had it. And so the ball cracks off Wirtz's bat. Willie Mays runs back to catch the ball. And right before that picture was taken, Willie Mays hits his hand into his glove, catches the ball, and the rest is history. Here's the interesting thing. That is known in the baseball world as simply the catch. One of the greatest catches ever in baseball. Now, here's why I share that story. The Gospels each tell a unique perspective of the life of Jesus from their vantage point. And this is Luke's Gospel. Let me tell you who Luke is. Luke is a Gentile writing to Gentiles, which means for us, absolutely nothing. <laughs> Until I decode it for you. And let me decode it. This is a pre-Luke 
is a previously unreligious guy writing to other non-religious people about how his life had been influenced by Jesus and about how potentially our non-religious life can be impacted by Jesus. And when I look around here this morning, here's what I see, a lot of non-religious types. I do, and I love it because we're here and we're wanting to learn. And so this is what what makes this encounter, I think, really important for us. This may be the first post-resurrection encounter other than the grave of Jesus in a risen, as a risen Christ with people who are talking about him and wanting to learn about him. And that's what makes this perspective, I think, so cool because it's the longest and most detailed encounter we have. Now, the biblical writers tell us this. I want you to know this. That uh, after the resurrection, there were 10 uh, sightings of the risen Christ uh, after the resurrection. In fact, Paul, when he's writing in uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, he tells about one encounter that involved over 500 people. So this is a thing, right? But, but what I want you to know is, is this encounter is unique because it gives us a perspective of what just might be possible for you and me if we could have an encounter with the post-resurrected Jesus. And what I want to draw your attention to this morning is that all of this begins with a conversation. It starts with a conversation. I think in some ways I would say Jesus is the master of subtlety. If you think about it, he comes uh, to us, you know, as a baby in a cradle, in a feeding trough, you know, cradle in a manger, and then he shows up in a post-resurrection encounter in a conversation where he just appears and he shows up and, and, and something incredible takes place. I was thinking about this. I want to share some things with you. Did you know that on an average day, you will have almost 40 conversations? 40 conversations. Your strongest muscle in the human body is your tongue. Currently, there are 6,000 different languages spoken on the globe. In Papua New Guinea, there are over 800 languages alone. On an average day, listen to this. A man on an average day will speak roughly 7,000 words in a day, on an average day. And on an average day, a woman (laughs) let me get it out a woman will speak 20,000 words. So you think about this, a man gets home, he's said all of his words, the woman gets home, they still got 13,000 stored up. I got a friend of mine who says it this way, he said, my wife, yep, pastor, she speaks 20,000 words a day with gusts up to 30 and 40,000 <laughs> words a day. I I know another guy who was having an argument with his wife. We've all had this kind of argument in your home. And finally, just in a moment of desperation, she says to him, she says, you know what? You know what? You're a horrible listener. And not knowing what to say, he said, you know what? You're a horrible summarizer. (laughs) Right? I was telling Beth about all this stuff. I found out about conversations. And she said to me, she goes, do you know why we speak so many words? And I was a little afraid to ask. And she said, because we have to repeat every single thing. I have to tell you, when she said that to me, I went, huh? (laughs) Yeah. But what I want you to notice is that it begins with these guys, they're just having a conversation. And they're having, I think, an important conversation. In fact, I think there's something here that we can really get our minds and hearts around. It happens in verse 14, and it says this. Luke 24, 14 says this. They were talking with each other 
about everything that's happened. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, of course they were. And that's a great cultural connect for us because that's what we're doing right now, right, in our lives. We are talking about all the things in our world that's going on. And there's a lot going on. I've, I've been keeping my own list. Maybe you have your list. There's the war in the Ukraine. Uh, our country seems hopelessly divided by our politics and by talk of racism. We have culture wars. We have a mental health crisis in our nation, particularly among younger generations. There's epidemic levels of loneliness and isolation. Addictions and compulsive behaviors are off the chart. There's inflation. There's the great resignation. You name it, we're talking about it. And that's before we even enter into the conversation and talk about some of the personal struggles we're having in our own lives and the personal struggles we're seeing in others. I, I have, as I've shared, I've been in this location as a pastor for 25 years. And I can tell you, I don't think I can really point to another time in my ministry in this spot where so many of my friends and so many within our circle are fighting some of the greatest battles of their lives. And you might be here and that's you. And in fact, I, I find a, a connection point in this scripture because this is what it says and we're learning all these things about conversation and language and words and all that. And I was reading recently, those who study this stuff tell us, listen to this, one other little fun fact about our conversations. Left to our own humanity, this person writes, most of our conversations, if they run long enough, they will turn negative and they'll turn hopeless. I think it's true. And when you get to verse 17, it's, it's interesting. It says that they were downcast. You know one of the Greek translations for the word downcast? You know what it means? It means overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed. And I don't know about you, but that's what's going on in our world. So many of us, we just look around or we look within us and we're overwhelmed. And Jesus, the risen Savior, who is a master at subtlety, shows up in that moment for them. When they were lost, when they were hopeless, when they were overwhelmed. And he flips the conversation. I love this. You get to Luke chapter 24 and verse 15, and it says, and they talked and discussed these things with each other, and Jesus came up and walked with them. It's sort of interesting right now that so often the arc of our conversation feels negative. I, I know someone recently who was sharing this incredible story, and they were talking about this place on planet Earth, which is in Chile, and it's the Atacama Desert. I want to show you a picture of it. This is, this is the driest place on planet Earth. It's in Chile, the Atacama Desert, and... Um, it's where NASA and others go to test out equipment that they're going to send to Mars because they, they have said, you know what, if the equipment will make it uh, in the Atacama Desert, maybe it'll make it on Mars. And sometimes, I don't know about you, but this is what our conversations feel like. They feel dead. They feel hopeless. They feel without any kind of redeeming value at all. And the Bible says in verse 15, that as they walked and discussed these things with one another, Jesus comes up and he walks with them. And I, I don't know about you, but I feel because this is maybe a post-resurrection story, it makes me wonder that if Easter doesn't just show us that Jesus is speaking to us and wanting to speak to us far more than we might ever realize. He changes their conversation. They didn't recognize him at first, and I wonder sometimes if that's not true of us. 
I mean, have you ever given any thought to the fact that maybe he's here and he's closer than you think he is? One of my favorite verses of Scripture around our Lord that we're worshiping this morning comes in the book of Hebrews, and it's Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and it says simply this. It says, in the past, God has spoken to us through, our, through the prophets and at many times through our ancestors in various ways. But listen to this. It says, in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. For the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining things by his powerful word. John, the beloved disciple, called Jesus the word of God. And Jesus himself said this, we don't actually live by bread alone, meaning the ordinary common things that feed us, but we can live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. I want to tell you what I believe around our current age. In all this time of question and chaos and struggle, you know what I almost feel? I feel like there's this great stripping away of every single thing that we are tempted to place our hope in so that maybe for the very first time we can see the only place where genuine hope actually lives. If you think about it, our world is just going through such upheaval and such chaos. And every single thing that you know, we've been kind of placing some hope around, as it were, I think is being revealed to us in many ways as just what I would refer to and others refer to as a secondary distinctive, right? What you do, where you live, how much you make, what your sexual identity is, what race you belong to, what country you live in, what political party you align with. These are all important to one degree or another, but they're secondary distinctives to you discovering for yourself that you're a child of God and a person of worth. And this is what God wants to say to all of us on Easter. He wants to change the conversation. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It seems strange, really, in our day to talk about God talking to us, doesn't it? And yet, in a way, lots of people across history have claimed to hear God still in small voice. George Washington Carver, Florence Nightingale, Blaise Pascal, Harriet Tubman, John Milton, my grandmother, my mother, me. God is here. And he wants to speak to you. Easter is this miracle opportunity to reorder things that have become jumbled up. It's a wonderful opportunity for all of us online, all of us right here, to just maybe in a moment of humanity, in a moment of, of understanding, God, I got the order wrong. It's you. It's you first. It's always been you first. And when we do that, he starts changing not only these things in our lives, he starts changing the conversation. Let me give you a fun fact. I get to do this because today's our church's birthday. I've always called Community of Hope my third kid. And um, years ago when we were, uh, had just found out we were going to move to Palm Beach County and start a church, and I had been praying about this, really wanting to do this, I reached out to denominational leaders. They told me no. They kept telling me no. I kept praying about it, kept praying about it. And finally, finally, the day before I'm going to fly to Korea to, to study the prayer movement in a doctoral cohort I was in, 
uh, I got a call from a denominational leader, and this is what he said, literally he said, you are going to plant a church, and he said it this way, I think you're going to go to Palm Beach County. The very next day, I got on a plane and flew to Seoul, South Korea with 14 of my friends, colleagues in a doctoral cohort. I left my wife, I left my two beautiful children, and to be honest with you, I felt like the, the, the dog that chased the truck, the milk truck, and caught it. And I, I thought, to be honest, you know, I've, I've been complaining and saying I want to plant a church, they're going to finally let me plant a church, and here's the one thing I don't know how to do, plant a church. And I thought, I mean, I had all this horrible dread. I'm not even making this up. I thought, I'm flying over to Korea. I mean, you're on this 10-hour flight, 11-hour flight. And I had the scenario all worked out. Like, Beth is going to see me as the failure that I am. She's going to leave me. We're going to get a divorce. The kids are going to hate me. It's going to be awful. I was like, by the time I got to Korea, man, I was like sky high. And we studied the prayer movement there. And then we went out from this church, and we went out to this place that they called Prayer Mountain. And Prayer Mountain is where the precious Korean people, they they still to this day do this. They go out to Prayer Mountain and they will pray on Friday and Saturday for the services at their churches on Sunday. And we went out as these 14 Americans and we're going to take part in this experience. And this little prayer, uh, this building was built into the side of this mountain. It had these little six by six rooms. And, and in the six by six rooms, people would, you know, go in there, close the door, pray all night. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. And I have to confess, I didn't even make it all night long. I made it to about three in the morning. But at around three in the morning, I had this impression on my heart, just crying out to God, saying, God, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I got myself into. This is going to be awful. I just feel this, all this stuff. And God said to me in my heart, he said, if you'll go to Palm Beach County like they want you to do, and you'll be obedient, and you'll not think they called you, you'll think I called you. And you'll be faithful. I'll build a community of hope. I have a journal, I wrote it down. That's where our church got its name, Community of Hope. Now here's the little fun fact. So that's March, we move in June, we come down here, you saw the video there, the rental house we were living in, and and, uh, when I got here, I... I started doing all these studies of Palm Beach County, all these people flooding, moving into Palm Beach County, and I did demographic studies, and I did what's called a psychographic study, like what are the felt needs of the area? And I discovered in that one of the the greatest, the single greatest felt need of people in 1997 moving into our area. You know what it was? Hope for tomorrow. Now, now, in case you didn't get it, I'm in Korea and God gives me the name of a church. It wasn't for three months later I discovered the biggest felt need of the area I was moving to. Hope for tomorrow. Only God, right? It's still the greatest need. It's still the greatest need. And it can happen to you today just in a simple conversation of you saying to this God you've just worshipped, I need you, I need you, and I want you in my life. And you know what I'm learning? God comes where he's wanted. And here's the question for all of us. Do you want him? Will you open your life to him? Will you step out of maybe your own understanding? And this is what I said in my notes. I don't want to miss this. I said, it's a powerful thing to consider that we have a God who out of his kindness and out of his mercy wants to give us something else to talk about and something more life-giving to frame our conversations around. So where it feels dark, we just remember Story's not over. Where it feels hopeless, we remember, story's not over. When it feels dead, story's not over. So the Atacama Desert, driest place on planet Earth. What's an interesting thing to consider, however, is that underneath the soil 
are over 250 varieties of flowers. And every now and again in the Atacama Desert, it gets a year's worth of rain in a day. And when that happens, this is what the Atacama Desert looks like. Anybody need some rain of God's spirit and God's grace and God's mercy on your life? Let him do what only he can do. Give you hope that'll never fade and never pass away. Lord, you come where you're wanted. I pray for all of my friends listening to the services online. I pray for all of our campuses. Now, God, I can say, you know, officially right, um, four expressions, three campuses, two languages. The community of hope story is continuing, and it's continuing because, Jesus, we are building our foundation upon you. Would you come and speak to all of my friends this morning and wherever they came in feeling as though something in their life is dead, would you remind them that you are the God of the living? And why would we ever search for the living among the dead? Because you have risen. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this might be the most important part of why you're here. We sing a lot of songs at Community of Hope, and we, we will even give permission to say, you can sing them aspirationally, which means that's not where you are, but maybe where you hope to, to be. But around the language of that song, I, I want to be clear, not everyone can sing it truthfully because you've never surrendered your trust into the capable hands of a God who has died for your sins. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. And so remember what I've said this morning. Jesus comes where he's wanted. And so I just want to say this morning, whether you're online, whether you're in this room, whether you're listening to me later, here's what I want to say. This is a moment for you to say yes to Jesus and to not hope in any other thing. And so I want to invite you into this prayer. Let's bow our heads and pray together and maybe just if that's you and you would say Lord I've been trusting in other things I've been doing other things would you just raise your hand so I can see it just raise it so I can see it and you're saying there's areas in my life Lord where I want to give my life now to you and ask you to do something new and fresh Lord Jesus you see these hands I pray in this moment for people to receive you into their life, to ask you to forgive their sins. God, to just really say, Lord, I'm here and to trust that you're here and that, Lord, you want to resurrect dead things. You want to give a hope that will never fade. So come into our hearts. Let us have the courage, Lord, to begin this step to build our lives upon you. For we pray together in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. I want to say this before you go. Uh, my wife and I, quite honestly, we've given our lives to live in Palm Beach County to build a church for non-religious types. That's for many of us in this room. And so I just want to remind everybody, a little tongue-in-cheek here, we actually do this kind of thing every seven days. <laughs> I know it's shocking. Every seven days. Come back. Come back. Learn with us. Learn with us. You're going to meet other normal people. We're all striving to know and understand this Jesus. Go in his grace. Go in his peace. Happy Easter. We'll see you next weekend. Amen.